For the next learning objective, your prescribed reading refers to a number of wicked problems. However, given the time constraints, we will only look at global poverty in this podcast. Please refer to your readings for a discussion of the other wicked problems. To start, let's watch a short video on global poverty. Back in the year 2000, the UN General Assembly adopted the Millennium Development Goals, one of which was to eradicate hunger and poverty by the year 2015. One of their immediate targets was to halve the number of people who are living on less than one dollar a day. Right now, that's about one billion people. Today we're in Copenhagen, Denmark. Behind me is the Stock Exchange building. In 2004, a group of respected world economists met in this city. Their goal was to prioritise world problems based on where economic resources could be put to best use. In what's been called the Copenhagen Consensus, they agreed that one of the world's top priority challenges, and one where results could be achieved, is reducing malnutrition and hunger. Then in 2005, many thousands of people came together across the world for a unique music event called Live 8. They came together from all walks of life, from across the ethnic and generational divide, not just for a musical celebration, but to make a statement. Effectively, they were saying, we believe that poverty can be ended, and we'd like to be a part of achieving that. So it seems there's been a growing public consensus all around the world that in an age of high tech and globalization, we ought to be able to do something to end the blight of extreme poverty. It can't be right that 850 million people are chronically malnourished all the time, when for just a relatively small investment of world income, we could produce reliable food supplies, control diseases, and even lift nations out of debt. So what are the factors that contribute to extreme poverty? Well, one, of course, is population growth. Every month, there are 7 million extra mouths to feed in the world. And the world's population will reach 9.5 billion by the year 2050. 20 years after that, says the UN, it might begin to decline. Of course, while the global population is growing, so is the world's economy. And the gap between average individual incomes in rich nations and poor nations is shrinking. So some of the poor are doing better, but not the poorest of the poor, who tend to be stuck at the bottom. Every year, 10 million children will die simply because their families, their communities and their nations are too poor to sustain them. Rising food prices are another real problem, especially for people who rely on food imports. Sadly, even when prices are low, millions will still starve. That's because the poorest of the poor live in outlying areas, eking out a living on meagre land holdings a long way from where food is distributed. Now, please take some time to read this definition. Based on this definition, which countries in the world have no poverty whatsoever? What about the difference between developed and developing world poverty? There are two ways to think about poverty, absolute and relative poverty. Absolute poverty refers to a person who lacks food, water, shelter or access to basic medical facilities, and clothing. However, you're considered to be relatively poor if you can afford less than everyone else around you. So you'd think it was reasonable to go with the first definition of absolute poverty. If we were a rich enough society that absolutely everyone could feed themselves and live in a decent house, then why call anyone poor? Poverty is very complicated and that is inherently problematic to measure. The UN is attempting to create absolute measures of poverty in the developed world context and in the developing world context. This is, of course, relativism 
but it doesn't set out but it does set out absolute measures that can be used for a, as a basis for comparison. There are multiple causes of global poverty in a number of parts of the world, such as unfair trade, war or conflict, little or no access to land, poor health care systems, etc. These multiple causes interact together to create the poverty trap, which makes it even harder to escape. Different events and circumstances in the lives of those living in poverty reinforce this situation and make it increasingly difficult to escape poverty. For example, hunger, disease and lack of education lead to fewer job opportunities. Those without a steady income are too poor to pay for food in times of crisis. Those without an education are less likely to know the causes of disease. Fewer educated people in a population means fewer people able to build an efficient infrastructure. Those who lack education, suffer ill health, go to bed hungry and live in poor housing also find it difficult or impossible to organize and make the demands heard by government authorities. In addition to being poor, they are powerless and this makes it even more difficult to escape the poverty trap. In response, the current approaches to solving the problem have included aid, fairer trade, debt cancellation, addressing climate change, tackling corruption, and increasing social inclusion. All these measures have led to fixing part of the problem. However, as we know, the entire problem hasn't been fixed. Now returning to the five characteristics of a wicked problem, our discussion of global poverty appears to meet all the criteria. Would you agree? Now think about some of the other wicked problems on the list earlier. Would you be able to explain how they too display these five characteristics?